Who in here likes to run? <laughs> I don't see a lot of hands. Okay. Who in here likes to eat? Okay. I think I'll see more. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I don't like to run. Okay. Um, who, who has ever run a 5K in here? Anybody? Okay. Um, what about a half marathon? Okay. Less hands. How about this? A full marathon. Even less. One? Are you the only one? Justin? Up there. Oh, psh. Okay, y'all don't count. No. <laughs> they run all the time. Okay. No. <laughs> I was looking for y'all. Yeah, you're up there. Okay. The pains are, are runners, if you know them. Okay. Um, well, I don't like to run. I have run the last several years. I do one race a year. And it's one in Tullahoma, my hometown. It's in honor of, of a young man who, who died uh, his senior year of high school or shortly after football player. Uh, his number was eight. So it's an 8K, which is around five something miles. And so I would run in honor of my sister who passed away. Uh, they would, it, it was that type of run. You would come to form a team to run in honor of someone. And I don't like to run. And I would every year, just this one time, just go bust out an 8K. And you know what would happen to me? I would almost die every time, every single time. And each time, I've done this three or four years, each time, I'm like, I'm going to start training a, a, a few months ahead. Then I'm like, I'm going to start training a few weeks ahead. Then it's, I'm going to start running the week before. <laughs> it never happens, never happens. And I go and I just run. And you know what? It is hard. <laughs> I start hurting. Uh, I try to, to make it where I, I don't walk some, but I have to, you know, I have to start holding parts of my body because it can't go anymore. And you just got to persevere through the pain, right? Now, in order to, that, that's an 8K, okay? Um, a full marathon, do you know how long that is? That's 26.2 miles. That's a long way. That'll make you go, <laughs> like, why would anybody do that, Pains? Um, <laughs> right? Uh, it, it takes a lot to get to that place where you can run that much. But also, even if you've trained and are ready, like, you have to persevere through a lot to do that. Are you with me? Are you tracking? You see where we're going here right now, okay? Um, so run, run a 26.2 miles. You know what I say to that? No, thank you. Okay. But um, it's, a, it's a lot that way uh, in serving the Lord. It's a lot like that in persevering in what he's called you to. It's a lot like that in, in sticking it out through the ups and the downs in ministry, in serving the Lord, in life, in where he's placed you and what he's called you to. It's a lot like running a marathon. Amen. It's not a sprint. And we're going to see that today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. Um, we're going to see the Apostle Paul. This is his second missionary journey. The first missionary journey lasted around a year. We're going to see he stays in Corinth a year and a half. Uh, a lot longer than he stays at most places in his missionary journey. Um, and do you think it's because it was easy and things were going well that he stuck it out there? So long? Say no. Uh, no, no. Then, then why did he persevere in Corinth? We're, we're going to look a little at that today. With this kind of analogy running through of, of marathons and, and running, we're going to draw some, some meaning from that. But the, this message is titled Persevering in Ministry. But it's not just in ministry. It is in ministry because God's called all of us to ministry. Yes. Amen? Amen? He's called all, if you are in Christ, you have a gospel ministry he has called you to. To proclaim the gospel, to, to show the love of Christ to a world who needs him, right? The, to, to share the gospel is, is what he's called you to. And it's not easy, but we're to persevere and we can persevere. And so we'll learn some from the Apostle Paul and some from this, this running, this marathon um, analogy. But... God is with us amidst the race. Amen? He, he empowers us. He has, there's a goal set before us, right? Hey, Jesus, uh, he, he didn't want to go to the cross, did he? I, I'm going to preach before we're preaching today, okay? He didn't want to go to the cross. 
But why did he? It's the goal that was set before him. He endured the cross with joy, right? He endured the cross because he could see what's the end goal of it. Your salvation. Praise the Lord. And it's with that same goal we live out the ups and the downs of life in Christ and the ministry he's called us to. So we see this with the Apostle Paul. So if you have your Bibles, hopefully you've opened up to Acts chapter 18 now. If you're able, please stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. This is the Apostle Paul in Corinth. This is the Word of God. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul, occupied, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Amen? And when they opposed and reviled him. So did that come easily, that proclamation? No. When they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. That's what happens when you reject Jesus. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Look at this boldness. You ready? His house was next door to the synagogue. Come on. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. Amen. Together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I'm with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. Look at this. For I have many in this city who are my people. Wouldn't you love to have a promise from the Lord like that? You think that would sustain you? And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made an attack, a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names in your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sothenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you're with us. And you promise us your presence. Lord, strengthen us today. And give us understanding of your word. Illuminate our minds and our hearts, Lord. Um, and strengthen us in the fight and the race. That we would finish strong and we would run the race <laughs> through the ups and downs. Fight through the pain and run towards the victory. For your glory. It's in Jesus' name. All God's people said... Amen. You may have a seat. Grab your bulletins. You'll see some fill-in-the-blank notes, okay? Um, the first thing we're going to see is, uh, it's an encouragement for you. Stick it out where God plants you. Stick it out where God plants you. We see in verse 1, where was Paul? Here. After this, Paul left Athens and went to where? Corinth. Corinth. And then go down to verse 11. And he stayed how long? A year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Was the ministry, did the ministry start off easy for Paul in Corinth? It didn't. It didn't, it didn't start off easy. Now he had some friends he met, but he was going to, to proclaim in the synagogue. This is, was his normal pattern. We've been walking through Acts. You see this. Every time he comes to a new place, where's the first place he goes to proclaim the gospel to? It's the synagogue to the Jews. And um, because Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, they have the scriptures are looking for him, and many Jews have missed him. Place your if you believe in the Old Testament, you believe in God, but you don't believe in Jesus, you are missing it. 
Jesus is the only way to salvation. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved than Jesus. Amen. And Paul would go to them. And you know what? They're not listening. They're opposing him and reviling him. Okay? So, uh, what would you do in that case? Would you say, oh, I tried. Well, yeah. And, And Paul does that. You see him kind of shake it off. You see him get a little testy here, right? A little uh, more harsh with him than he usually does. He's like, fine. (laughs) It's it's the Jacob standard version, JSV, okay? Fine, so be it. Um, And and he says, the blood be on your hands. This is, I've proclaimed to you and you haven't believed. That's on you, right? And and then he goes in boldness to uh, right next door, and we'll see that in a little bit. But even after God gives him his promises and he keeps proclaiming, they come and they uh, try to try him, saying, you're going against the law. This is after God's promises. And, and you see this hardship come about through Paul. Uh, what would you do? Oh, I tried some more. It's not working out. And Is that how we would do? We see this all throughout with Paul. But what does Paul do? He perseveres. He stays there for a year and six months. This is longer than his whole first missionary journey. He planted himself in Corinth, right? So I want us to think, as we pursue ministry... And everybody has a ministry if you're in Christ, right? As we pursue what he's called us to, what keeps us, what sustains us, what allows us to persevere through that ministry? Uh, We'll see. uh, We'll see through this testimony of Paul some of the ways. uh, And and I hope it encourages you today to keep keep going, to plant your feet down and keep going for the Lord. I'm encouraged through the testimony of Paul, but also through church history. There's a lot of people that we hold in high regard in church history um, who had a very difficult time in ministry, but they persevered through it. Um, I think of, did you know Jonathan Edwards was voted out of his church? Would you? Well, I don't want to ask that because I'm not even close to Jonathan Edwards. And you're like, get him out of here. Okay. Jonathan Edwards, one of the greatest preachers of all time was voted out of his church. He kept on going though. Hudson Taylor, great missionary to China. To China. Um, the, the Chinese weren't hearing the gospel when he was going because he didn't look like them. He didn't act like them. He didn't have the customs. So you know what he did? He was a pioneer in this. He contextualized the gospel to reach them where they are so they would understand. But then you know what happened after he started doing that? The Christians were reviling him and saying, you can't do that. You can't dress like them. You can't act like them. So then he was having it from the Christians. But did he persevere? Yeah, he did. And so many people have come to faith through him. Uh, Adoniram Judson, great missionary to Burma. If you haven't heard of these people before, look them up, read their biographies. It will encourage you. He faced hardship after hardship after hardship death and loss and pain and suffering. He didn't see the first convert. He's a missionary. What do, you, what do missionaries go for? To convert people, to, to bring people to the Lord. He didn't see his first convert until the sixth year of ministry in Burma. But by the time he left, you can't count how many, so many people had come. He persevered. How, how easily would we have quit, Right? Uh, I'm reminded of, of Charles Simeon, the great preacher. He was called to pastor a Holy Trinity in Cambridge. Um, he was young. They, they appointed him to pastor that church, but the people didn't want him to. They liked this other guy. So back in the day, you see these We still have pews, right? Well, they, they used to have uh, doors on the pews. Have you ever been to a church like that? Sarah and I went to... Um, um, vacation in Charleston. The oldest Southern Baptist church is in Charleston. And we went and toured it. You know what? It still has the doors on the pews. And, and they said people used to pay for the pews back then. You know what the most expensive ones were? The back ones. <laughs> back row Baptist, right? That's what it is. Back there, okay? We're watching y'all's tithe this week. No, it's a joke. It's a joke. But, but really, um, they would pay for, pay for the pews. Um, and so when Charles Simeon came, uh, the people who paid for the pews, you know what they did? They didn't come. They didn't show up. So other people couldn't sit in the pews then. 
They had to, Charles Simeon had to rent other seats and stools and line the, the aisles, and he would only preach to guests because the people wouldn't show up. He wanted to hold a PM service, but they didn't want him to. So they had the guy that they wanted to be the pastor come preach at the PM services. And when he was wanting to hold services, you know what they did? They locked the doors to the church so he couldn't get in. What would you do? What would you do? <laughs> I'll go somewhere else, right? Or have church outside. And um, it wasn't until he, he persevered. He persevered. It wasn't until five years in that they allowed him to start preaching that PM service. You know how long he pastored that church? 54 years. <laughs> One of the greatest preachers, expositors of the Bible of history. I'm encouraged. Ups and downs, whatever you face, to stick it out through church history. You won't do anything significant for the Lord if you church hop, if you bail, if you don't stick it out. You know what the, the most um, godly, mature Christians I know throughout every church I've been at are the ones who have stuck it out through thick and thin and have been there a long time. It's so easy to bail. Not just in church, but, but in life in general and opportunities. And I don't see that in church history through these hardships. You, would, you wouldn't have names like Jonathan Edwards and Charles Simeon, Adoniram Judson, Hudson Taylor if they didn't persevere through the hardships. You wouldn't have the church develop and grow in Corinth if you didn't have the Apostle Paul through ups and downs stick it out for a year and a half. Right? And then write letters back to them. Speaking of that, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. Here's what Paul says about his time. He said, And I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Didn't you like, love that, that second song we sang? I know it's probably new to you, but oh, Christ be magnified. Christ be magnified in me. Is that your heart cry? Is it? It should be in everything. And this is why he came preaching. This, this Apostle Paul who, who knew the Word of God, who was trained and eloquent in speech. This Apostle Paul who, who was uh, mighty and could do many things. And he had reason to boast. Here's what he said about when he came to Corinth. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's how the Apostle Paul came and ministered in Corinth. And now he's writing back to a church that is still there. It's still struggling. It's still going through hard times. But it's still there seeking to serve the Lord. Amen? Stick it out where God plants you. Just as a marathon runner, think of this, commits to, has to commit to rigorous training, right? Uh, unless you don't want to, if you don't want to die while running the race, like I do every time in that 8K. Um, but facing challenges and moments of wanting to give up. So we are to remain steadfast where God has placed us, trusting in his strength to persevere. Who have, who's heard of Eric Liddell, Chariots of Fire? Anybody? He was a great Christian man, missionary actually, but a great runner, okay? Uh, if you've ever seen the movie. But Eric Liddell ran in a meet between England, Ireland, and Scotland. He ran the 100, 220, and 440-yard events. In the 440, uh, he got off to a bad start. When the gun sounded, there was a lot of shoving to get in front of the inside lane, uh, the advantageous position. Uh, and Liddell uh, tangled feet with J.J. Gillies of England, and he fell. He fell down. Now, in uh, a 440 yards, if you fall, and he got, I think, 20 yards behind, um, is that easy to come back from? No. But uh, he, did, he was trying to decide, not knowing if he could get up, and an official yelled, get up and run. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now. Don't yell at him. I want you to tell him, though, get up and run. This is encouragement for us today. You know what he did? 
He got up and ran. And he started <laughs> running as fast as he could. And he caught up with them in a quarter mile. It's a big distance to make up. In his unorthodox style, they say, of running, he took off after the pack. He pulled into fourth place, 10 yards behind the leader, J.J. Gillies. With 40 yards to go, he pulled into third place. And second, right at the tape, he passed Gillies, stuck out his chest, and he won the race. Isn't that incredible? He won the race. You can see it in Chariots of Fire. It's not the big moment, but, but it's incredible. An article appearing the next day in the Scotsman paper said, the circumstances in which Liddell won the race made it a performance bordering on the miraculous. One of the greatest runs I've ever seen. But what did it start with? Falling. And then what? What did you tell your neighbor? Get up. Get up and run. You know what most people would do? Ah, oh, it's over. There's no way. Don't even get up and run. Or if you get up, I'm already last place. I'm just going to go. And what, what does he do? They make a movie about him. Why? Because I'm going to go full speed. I don't care. And he wins the race. Amen. I want to tell you, church, get up and run. <laughs> do what he's called you to. Proclaim the gospel. There's something about, glorious about getting up off the track after you've been knocked down and running again. Win or lose, you don't stay down. Come on, church, right? All right, so here's the next point. This is, we're going to see how you get up and run, how you keep persevering, how you go even when it's hard. We see it through the Apostle Paul. Here's one big reason we see with him. We need partners in life and ministry. We need people alongside us. We need people to encourage us, to help us, to mutually edify, to, to go together right? We see this in verses two through three. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. I think one of the great reasons Paul persevered was because of the support he had around him. He ministered. He had a place to stay there. The boys weren't there with him yet. They hadn't brought the funds. And uh, Paul, uh, whenever he needed to, to earn his way, he didn't have funds from other churches. Uh, what did he do as a living? He was a tent maker. A lot of people think it wasn't just building tents, but it was a lot like a leather maker. Okay, uh, This is what they would do. And he saw some other believers who were in the same trade. They, they probably were running a, a business and he partnered with them. But he didn't just partner in life. He also partnered in ministry with them. Okay? But there's something incredible here. It, it strengthened Paul having Priscilla and Aquila. I, I don't think he could have or would have stuck it out if he didn't have that community around him. Okay? It's the same for you. You were not intended or designed to live life in isolation, especially the Christian life. Amen. You weren't designed, intended to come sit on a pew and not get to know people around you. To not go sit in a circle at any time. To not sit across the table at any time. Are you with me? We weren't designed and intended to, to do life alone, especially ministry alone. You know, Jesus didn't do ministry alone even. He had 12 around him. When Jesus sent people, how did he send them? Two by two. Didn't send them to do ministry. We weren't designed to, to be alone. We need community around us. It strengthens us. It helps us. But also we see something incredible. It not only strengthened Paul, but it also strengthened Priscilla and Aquila. These two people, they're not just mentioned right here. They're mentioned several times in the Bible. We'll see coming up next week. Uh, we see in verse 18, after this, Paul stayed many days longer and took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. They came with them. Romans 18, or sorry, Acts 18, 26. This guy, Apollos, you'll see Paul later write about Apollos. Apollos planted, or uh, I planted Apollos water. This, Apollos has a ministry uh, there in Corinth, but he started off being shaky in his theology, okay? And look at verse 26 of 18. Apollos began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Isn't that awesome? You see, their, their time with Paul allowed them to, them to grow in the Lord, and they are discipling people who will then grow other people in the Lord. Are you with me? Both of them are growing, and both of them are doing the work of the ministry because they're doing it together. Are you with me? Romans 16, 3. Paul says, greet 
uh, really, Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. We were not meant to do ministry alone. Do you know, I'm not just talking about pastors here. I'm talking about all ministry. But did you know pastoral ministry is, has one of the highest burnout rates? Uh, statistics are showing even more and more in, in this day and age. Pastors burn out and, and leave the ministry altogether. Okay? Um, Barna did a study uh, in two, 2022 of, of pastors who within that year had contemplated, since really contemplated leaving ministry. You know what the second number, 43% of them, it was because they feel lonely and isolated. 43%. It was just right behind the stress of the job, which was like at 50, low 50s, okay? Was feeling lonely and isolated. Not having people around them, right? We need to do ministry together. Uh, runners, going back to this analogy, they often train with people, right? Did you know you can run... Um, a tracking app found we run seven seconds a mile faster when we run with a group instead of alone. Right? It doesn't seem like a lot, but when you add it up, it is, right? Just with a group, you have a faster pace. Uh, if you've ever been racing somebody, you want to beat them too, right? Or if they're getting a little ahead of you, what do you do if you're running long distance? Ah, I got to keep up. It, it makes you push a little harder than you would if you're running alone. Are you, you see this? You see this? So in this running metaphor, we see this, this same thing. Um, but it also helps us when we think we can't finish. When you think you've run out. When you think you can't go any further. I'm burnt out. I can't do it. Someone coming alongside you. What does that do? Man, it encourages you. Man, it gives you strength you didn't know you had. And we're running the race together now when I wanted to give up. If I was an emotionally manipulative past preacher, I would play a video clip right now, and every single one of you would be crying in here, okay? Of a guy running uh, in the 1992 Olympics, Derek Redmond, uh, tore a hamstring early in the 400-meter race. Is there a picture up here? Yeah. I'll, I'll link to this video later, so you can cry later, but not during the service, okay? Um, he... he he falls and he tears his hamstring. He can't go on and he's trying to get up. He's crying. Olympic runner. <laughs> his dad comes out of the stands, comes down to him and helps his son finish the race. He knows he's the last place, but he's going to finish it. And why could he finish it? Because he has someone with him. It's the same way with us, y'all. Same way with us. When you think you can't go any further, we need each other to help push us and lead us and guide us. So we'll, we'll go further, we'll go faster, we'll go bigger, we'll, we'll do more for the glory of God together and then individually with what he's called us to. And when we think we can't go any further, when we want to throw in the towel, we need each other to keep going. <laughs> Not only that, but this is the guy's dad. We... We have God who's with us. Amen? Amen. To, he wants us to finish and run with endurance the race set before us. Because he's with us, here's our next point. We can have boldness in proclaiming the gospel. Amen? We need boldness in proclaiming the gospel. Verses 4 through 8. He reasoned with them in the synagogue every Sabbath, tried to persuade Jews and Greeks, and when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia... Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. That's boldness, right? I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Isn't that what God called Paul to? You remember that early on? That was the calling God placed on his life. And when you see Paul, he's referred to as Saul at that time. Um, but he goes to, uh, an angel goes to Ananias and says, I want you to go touch him. Scales will fall from his eyes. He says, I'll show him he how much he must suffer for my name. That's part of the calling God had on Paul's life. But also, he said, he's my chosen instrument to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, right? And so he said, 
I'm innocent. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. Now look at this boldness. First, he says to those in the synagogue, the blood be on your hands. And if you, if you don't have faith in Jesus, hear me, there, your blood is on your hands. You have to pay for your sins because the blood of Jesus doesn't cover you. Jesus paid once and for all, for all who believe in him. Have you done that? If you haven't, you can, right here, right now. No matter where you are online even, where you are, right here, right now, you can place your faith in Jesus. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Will you do that now? And he proclaimed it to them. And when they wouldn't believe in the boldness, he went right next door to the synagogue and set up shop and started pro- kept proclaiming, kept going, right? And then the leader of the synagogue, guess what happened? He ended up coming to faith in Jesus. Amen? The boldness, our boldness in proclamation, it's not in our own strength. It's not in our own determination. I, I can't fail. I just got to keep going, pick myself up by my bootstraps. No, the power we have to proclaim, the boldness we have to proclaim, one, it's because the Holy Spirit's within us. But, but two, it's because the power comes from the gospel itself. The word for power, um, it's the Greek word dynamis. What does that sound like to you? It's where we get our English word dynamite, this explosive power, right? Romans 1.16, I want you to hear what Paul says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Amen. Amen. Comma, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's exactly what's happening right here. The gospel is the power of God. So in the synagogue, I'm going to proclaim to you, believe in Jesus. He and only he can and will save you. You won't believe. I'm going to keep proclaiming next door. Even someone from the synagogue ends up believing and many others are believing because the gospel is powerful to save. Mighty in power. And that's why we can have boldness. He said, remember, we read it earlier. I I came not with eloquent speech but in weakness. But we saw God do a mighty work in Corinth. You know why? Because of the power of the gospel to save. When you think you can't, he can. When you think you're weak, he is strong. You don't have to know anything except, you ready? Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that's what Paul did That's what he proclaimed, and that's why he could be bold. When you're running a marathon, you have to to push through pain, don't you? Both physically and mentally. You keep going no matter what. The Jews didn't accept the truth that Jesus was the Messiah, but Paul was bold. So bold that he set up church next door to this Jewish synagogue. And Crispus, a ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. Now that is the power of God for salvation. Amen. You can be bold, and you're told to proclaim. Here's our next point. We need to lean on the promises of God, okay? We need to lean on the promises of God. We're talking about persevering through ministry, persevering through um, working for the Lord, and persevering through doing what he's called us to. One of the big reasons I think Paul persevered was because of of, uh, Priscilla and Aquila and the community he had. But here's the other big reason. He had some promises of God, promises that sustained him no matter what he went through. Guess what? You do too. We have to lean on the promises of God. Look at 9 through 11. If I was told this, which we are in a sense, it, but if I was told this, I, I would stick it out no matter how long. Listen to what he was told. Verses 9 through 11. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. And here's the promise. For I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. Look at this. For I have many in this city who are my people. And then it says, and he stayed a year and six months among them, teaching the word. The promises of God. Do you remember the last words of Jesus? If you knew you were going to see somebody for the last time, do you think you would pick your words very carefully? 
Yeah. Jesus knew he was going to see his disciples for the last time, and he knew these words would carry on to today and on into eternity. Um, you think he chose his last words carefully? Yeah. You know what he said? Go, make disciples of all nations. That's what he told us, a command, a commission. So we have a ministry, right? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Normally, we put a period right there. That's not his last words he said. To his disciples and to us, you know what he said after that? I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Just like he said to Paul right here. Stick it out. It's hard. It's difficult. Keep teaching. Do not be silent. Keep proclaiming the gospel. I am with you. There are many people here who need to hear who I want to save, and you are the one to teach them. You're the one to tell them. You're the one to proclaim to them. And you know what? He says the same thing to you about Portland, about your family, about your coworker. Maybe you're in that hard place, that hard job. That place you want to get away from, that rough circumstance, that relational difficulty, because God wants you to be bold with the gospel that saves. And you have an opportunity, even amidst hardship, even amidst difficulty, even amidst a job you don't like, to say, let me tell you about Jesus. Amidst your weakness, because he is strong and mighty to save. Amen? Amen. We need to lean on God's promises. That encourages you to keep going. If you're running a race, you're tired. Uh, think a marathon. You're, you're exhausted. You, you get to the end. Your body's worn out. But, but what happens when you get close to the crowd that's cheering? What happens? Somehow, even though you can't take another step almost... You have this renewed boost of energy. Some, somehow you can go even faster. They say um, runners can run two to five seconds per mile faster because of the adrenaline of the crowd cheering them on. You have the promises of God cheering you on, saying, I'm with you, I'm with you, keep going, keep going. You can do it. You can do it. I know you're hurting. I know it's painful. I know you think you can't keep going, but I'm with you. Come on, come on, come on. And he's with us, running alongside us. You can do it. Amen. We need to cling to the promises of God to sustain us amidst what he's called us to. And lastly, we see this. We can cling to the promises of God because God is faithful to fulfill his promises. Amen? He is faithful to fulfill his promises. Right after God says this to Paul, he says, I'm going to be with you. I won't let anyone hurt you. They take Paul and they're saying, we want to hurt him. <laughs> they're saying, they're throwing accusations at him. Nobody does that to, to pastors, do they? Okay. I'm just... <laughs> They're doing that to Paul, throwing accusations at him. And, and God had just promised, I'm with you, I'm with you. Nobody's going to hurt you. So he keeps going. And we see in verses 12 through 17. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, he didn't even have to say anything, y'all. Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime of Jews, I would have have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names of your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. He said, this is a matter of Jewish law. This isn't a matter of our law. Y'all deal with it yourselves. I'm, I want no part of it. Okay. What did God do? With Paul. He fulfilled his promise to Paul. He said, Nobody here is going to hurt you. And Paul, it looks like, it looks like somebody's going to hurt me. And he's about to open his mouth to even defend himself. And he doesn't even have to say a word because God fulfills his promises. Even when you don't understand, even when you can't see it, even when you think he's not coming through, God always fulfills his promises. And you can. 
believe in him. You can trust him. You can follow him. You can keep going. You can finish the race. One more marathon story. Okay? Prior to the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, John Stephen, a quarry of Tanzania, he was a, just another marathon runner, uh, an Olympic caliber runner. He'd won marathons in Africa running with times under two and a half hours. But he easily qualified for the Olympics. But in Mexico City, a quarry encounter, encountered an obstacle he never faced before. The altitude it caused his legs to cramp severely. He kept running. Then halfway through the race, he tangled with some runners, fell, dislocated his knee, scraped up his leg, hurt his shoulder as he fell. What would you do? I give up. I can't run the rest of this dislocated knee, all scraped up, broken. I, I can't go anymore, right? What do you think he did? You know, I wouldn't say, yep, he gave up. All right, let's pray. No, he kept going. He kept going. I want you to see this picture of him right here. This is a picture of him. He, he kept going. Um, when he finally entered the arena for the final lap, only a couple thousand people were still there left to see him complete the race. He finished dead last, more than an hour behind the winner. Lights were already starting to be shut off in the arena. But he came in. And he kept running. He kept going. He didn't give up. The crowd started. The little people who were left, they started cheering for him as he ran, as he finished the race. And as reporters, listen, they talked to him later. They said, why didn't you quit when you were hurt and bruised and bloody and discouraged? Why didn't you quit? And here's his answer. My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. That's what he said. Run with endurance the race that God has set before you. Looking forward to the prize in the heavenly places, not just for you, but for all those whom he places in your path to minister to, to love, to share the power of the gospel with. It's not in our own strength that we keep going. Paul went to them. He said, I came to you discouraged, broken, not with eloquent words, but, but only knowing Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that's all we need. With others with the same mindset coming alongside us, maybe you need to be that person for someone else. Relying on the promises of God and knowing he is certain to fulfill his promises. He is with you as we follow his will and his ways, proclaiming his word. You can persevere through whatever God places in front of you. The Apostle Paul's proof, the year and a half he spent at Corinth. I want that to be this way here for me. I want it to be that, this way here for you. I want to see myself grow and I want to see you grow together and then individually in different ministries, just like Priscilla and Aquila and Paul. This is what I want to see. Because then a church developed in Corinth, the church that Paul could write back to three times. Right? Are you, you want to stick it out? You want to see God move in mighty ways? You want to see him save people that we think he can't even save? You want to see him work through you in power like you can't believe? Let's work together. Let's rely on his promises and let's go and keep going no matter what for his glory with the power of the gospel.